Well, since we have everybody, I know it's 6.58, but we can get started since we have all of our members. I'm going to start with, uh, I'll call the meeting to order. Thank you, Brandon, for taking notes. And uh, let's do roll call. Okay, Brandon. Present. Melanie is excused, but we'll probably be here later. Carla. Present. Linda. Present. Catherine. Here. Roxanne. Here. Aaron. Here. Mark. Here. All right. That feels good. It's like back to my classroom days. So thanks for that. Okay. Next on the agenda, we have public comments and uh, we have none. Next, announcements or communications? Are there any? No, okay, next, the approval of the agenda. Is there a motion? I move, Roxanne, I oh, move to I'll approve move. the agenda. Roxanne moves, is there a second? I second. Aaron seconds. Any discussion? Um, I would uh, like to consider two different changes. Um, one would be, should we possibly move up the friends presentation earlier on the agenda so that they don't have to stick around for the whole time or and anyone who's watching, if the friends were watching and they didn't want to, uh, stick around. So that would be my first amendment. The other, the second, do you want me to wait on the second one or say them both? Hear them both. Okay. The other is that we should, um, amend the 2020 calendar operations um, for, so under action items. Mm -hmm. A new D? Yes. Amend 2020 calendar. Okay, where did you propose we move to the friends? After library director's report, perhaps? Um, yes, probably before, yeah. under committee liaison reports maybe, put friends in there. Okay, so um, let's, um, so you're moving, there's a, to amend the amendment, right? So you're, you move to move the discussion item 10A up to, let's just call it a new eight. Okay. Um, is there a second for that? Second. Catherine seconds. Okay, discussion of changing the agenda as proposed. Oh, and adding the amendment for the 2020 calendar to action items. Hey, Stacey, can we just call it instead of new eight, can we call it like eight AA or something? So it doesn't change all the other items below it. Oh yeah, for notes purposes? Yeah. Fine by me. Two. Eight. Okay, really the point is, can we move the friends no. Okay, uh, let's vote. So we moved uh, friends meeting up to like 8A, right after library director's report. Mm -hmm. And we've added action item B, which is amending the 2020 calendar. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, let the record reflect that this motion was adopted unanimously. So now let's vote on the overall agenda. It was already motion and seconded. Um, all in favor of the revised agenda, say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, let the record reflect that this motion was adopted. Uh, okay. I'm, so, I'm sorry, Stacey, can someone remind me who seconded uh, Carla's motion? Catherine. It was me, Catherine. It was Catherine. It was Catherine. Catherine. Okay, now you guys gotta keep me, keep me on my toes when I end up there because I don't have a revised agenda. I just have a weird penciled, scribbled agenda now. Okay. Uh, next on the agenda is acceptance of the minutes from June 23rd. Carla motions to accept the minutes. Thank you, is our second? Roxanne seconds. Thank you. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of accepting the minutes? Aye. 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 All opposed? Let the record reflect that this motion was adopted unanimously. Okay, next, 
uh, financial reports. Uh, first of all, um, any questions from trustees? They're included in your packet, of course. Carla doesn't have questions about the financial reports. I even printed them, but I it all look in order to me. <laughs> <laughs> Any other? Um, oh, so the budget committee met um, yesterday, and can I just comment to Brandon something that came up about? Okay, um, you were we were looking at how much at the previous year's budget and um, how things turned out at the end. And um, Emily had stated that it was, um, we were about $6,000 got added to fund balance. So if you guys didn't notice um, that happened, but um, originally for the year, we were assuming that we would go dip into fund balance by like $139,000 because of the, um, the digitization project was a big part. Um, I think that was, wasn't that the bulk of why we were dipping in? Um, and, and so we ended up still adding $6,000 to fund balance in, at the end of the year. So I would just notice that. I thought you guys might wanna hear it. Thanks for highlighting that, Carla. Brandon, did you have something that you wanted to say earlier? I couldn't tell if your hand was up or you were rearranging. Um. I was probably doing both actually. Uh, so my only question is, Emily, um, I'm sorry for not asking this yesterday during our budget meeting, but has all of the 1920 funds been allocated? Do we have any invoices remaining that you know of or large expenses or, or are we pretty much done? Um, not that I know of. I think we are done. Great. Even better news considering Carla's last comment. Okay. Uh, next, we have library director's report. First of all, anything to add since it's been published, Emily? Yeah, um, we are going to get two additional phones for the period where the server is going to be down. Um, I've spoken with Mike Kirby, and he's going to set us up with um, two phones that the city he has. So on, so on top of the monitor phone and our runner phone, that gives us four phone lines. I also just read an email where he said they're working on a way to route our calls that would normally come into like our main lines like we can get certain um extensions routed to these cell phones so he's working on setting up a service for that so that will be especially helpful if we could keep our adult services our youth services and our scheduling line open that would be huge um just some other notes is oh um i also just spoke with aaron we've been kind of toying with the idea of starting a delivery service and there's questions about what kind of a vehicle we use whether we have staff use their own or whether we could get one from dps and aaron says that he has a vehicle that he could let us use and all we'd have to pay for is the gas and it's a large van and he said i don't know if that'd be too big and i said no that's great that's perfect so um yeah, I'm going to talk with him more about that tomorrow. We weren't able to touch base over the phone today, but um, that I just wanted to let you know what we have discussed so far. Um, I also got an email from Catherine's husband who works for the Daily Tribune, and he said he's going to be happy to help us launch the, the Tribune. Um, back in another world, they had these ideas that when we did the Tribune launch, we'd have a big party, a big gala event to launch it and invite people and have them speak and have photos up. Now everything's going to have to be online, but I still think we can do some really cool things with it. And um, he knows a lot of the people who have worked on it throughout the years that he's going to um, help us get going on, on this launch so that hopefully we can have it up and running soon. It hasn't been installed on the computers yet. They had um, an issue with TLN coming out the other day, so they are now coming in on Thursday to install it. Um, and then I just wanted to read off, I always like to read off staff compliments that we've gotten, and we've gotten a lot lately. Um, especially, you know, I was just talking to Erin, and she wanted to commend the um, contactless pickup service and the staff being especially helpful there. We's, we've also had a lot of really nice comments about the programming going on. So, you know, I have one here that said, um, and I believe this was a Facebook message. It said, you really did a great job. My kids were thrilled with the supplies and ideas. We appreciate you so much. So that was a comment on one of the programs. Another one was, um, this was um, a lady said, thank you so much. This was very fun and informative. Please add me to your list if you offer this again. I'm home all summer with my granddaughter and she loved it. I believe that was a 4th of July program, but I'd have to check. Um, 
And then I have, this was a letter that was sent to Barb. So Barb Sikowski is one of our youth librarians and she does um, the uh, readers or, or um, yeah, sorry. Um, the, um, I, gosh, I forgot the name already. Um, the book group for the kind of um, more beginner reader crowd. And this says, um, She's, she got a letter that said, thank you so much, Barb, for offering that wonderful library program. My son, Eamon, rhymes with Sam, sorry, <laughs> Eamon, rhymes with Sam and enjoyed it so much and appreciated all the great craft supplies and ideas. He is a very creative kid and loves arts and crafts. When I saw this, I thought it would be great for him. Although he's a teenager, he loves the library programs for kids more so than those made for teens. He felt a bit awkward at first when he saw how young the other kids were, especially because he didn't know anyone. Thank you for warmly welcoming him. Anyway, we normally do a lot of library programs throughout the year and have really missed them the past four months. Both my son and I have medical conditions. He had open heart surgery as a baby. And I do want to say she gave us permission to read this too. Um, our health problems make us part of the vulnerable population. So we will be staying at home much longer than the general population. Thank you for making the long drive to deliver the craft supplies. Talk about going above and beyond. So I believe this was the one too, as a side note, I think Barb drove out to, oh my gosh, I believe this was Redford that she drove all the way out to deliver these craft supplies. Oh, and by the way, I cannot believe you're 62. You don't look or sound like it. Ammon and I enjoyed your lively personality and hope to be able to join you in another program soon. We were happy this program was for families. Sometimes Ammon wants to do activities, but they are for younger kids. Our librarians know him so well that they allow him to attend programs for the younger kids. Again, I wanted to thank you for the program. It was a great idea just to just let the kids create and socialize instead of having a craft that everyone does. It was nice to how you let them do their own thing and use their creativities. One of these days, we hope to meet you in person. So when we received that, we were all in tears and um, Barb did reach out to the mother and she asked if she'd be allowed to share and the mother was more than happy to let us. So I just wanted to pass it along because um, I, especially Barb and Barb's been getting a lot of comments like this because um, she's been running a lot of the programs and I think she does such a tremendous job of connecting, not just with the kids, but with the parents. And she really goes so above and beyond and makes those special connections. So that is the end of my report. Thank you, Emily. Are there um, questions for the director? Uh, Catherine. I don't have a question, but just a comment to add to the compliments. Um, since our last meeting, I've been able to use my Libro. I send my kids up for summer reading. And um, I wish that all contactless pickup through this was as easy as the library was because I, I mean, it was legit waiting right there for me as I walked up and it just the timing of it the app worked really well um, and same thing um, as far as ease of use for the sign up for summer reading so I just wanted to compliment I know it's not just the programs but the behind the scenes work that gets that done so I'd like to compliment Bo so thank you mm -hmm. thanks Catherine I would echo that too I've had a really good experience that app had a couple buggy things and um, our access service director, um, our department head reached out right away and tried to help troubleshoot it, worked with the app people, and then there was an update to the app. So I'm, I'm amazed at how quickly problem solving's happened. So I echo that, Catherine. Any other questions for the director? Brandon. Thank you. Um, so first, that's an amazing story about Barb. Barb's a uh, great librarian. So that's uh, thank you for sharing that with us, Emily. Um, so I was reading through these reports, um, and one I think I just you know publicly we should thank Toad Opener. I don't know if uh, the public's going to read our uh, report, but they donated um, the uh, touchless openings to the doors in the library, which is a thousand dollar expense. So thank you to them. Uh, they're around town and they're, they're pretty easy to use. Um, so then uh, I just, I have a question about Adrian's report. Um, and it, it's kind of getting to the minutia of how we count stuff, but Adrian's report indicated that we're not counting open days um, right now. And I was just thinking of Roxanne and QSEC and how we calculate our opening days every year. Um, and should we be counting days as being open um, when we're doing contactless delivery? Um, the building's not open to the public, but we are providing service. So I, I, I think that's just a question. I do agree with that. I think we should be. Um, we count them. We actually consider them open days because that's how we tell people um, when to return their items. This was when um, we're going to reopen the, the bins outside. But um, when we just wanted people to drop them off at the door, we would say stop by during open hours. So technically, we're calling them open hours. And that's the whole thing. Um, changing the calendar is to reflect that we're technically open 
on that Friday um, before Labor Day. So yeah, I do agree, and I will make a note. I think that we that's okay. And then continuing on um, in Adrian's report, we had three hundred three computer computer uses in June. Um, how is that possible? No, that's funny. That was something I noted too, and I was going to ask Ed about, and I forgot. I actually okay. noticed it too um, last time too, and I had asked him about it, and he wasn't sure. And then I saw it reflected again, and I forgot to follow up with him. But I do not know what that is. I'm guessing it was probably just an error in the spreadsheet. But... Okay. Um, I'm sorry. You have more, Brandon? Uh, yeah, so j j just like two more things, um, and then um, I, you know, I usually say something about Matt's formatting and calling out the strategic plan, and I see Amy change her report to the same uh, same type of format. I think it's really useful for us. So thank you uh, to the staff for continuing to keep us informed on how we're progressing on that. Uh, it was a long three years to make it, so I'm happy to see how it's uh, moving along. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for the director? Okay, the window's closing. Okay, next we have, um, it's technically committee and liaison reports, so but we're gonna, we have two friends here with us today. Mitzi and Larry are here. And um, I understand, welcome, we're so glad you're here. We love the friends of the Royal Oak Public Library. Um, Thank you. So I understand that there are some updates that you'd like to give us. So who should I hand the floor over to to, to uh, start? Mitzi, do you want to go? You need to unmute. <laughs> there you go. OK. Um, thanks again. We uh, are doing this as our joint meeting. I have a feeling that a lot of other people are doing joint meetings um, virtually as well. But um, the Friends Board has been meeting every month. We haven't skipped a month because things are happening or else they're just not happening, but we're all getting together to kind of get a handle on, on where we are, um, especially in relationship to where the library is with their planning. Um, just, I guess, there's just made a little list about um, kind of currently where we're at. We um, didn't realize it at the time, but we were very, very fortunate that we pulled off uh, a successful book sale, large sale, just a week or two before everything was closed down. So that, that um, definitely reflects positively on, on our budget. Um, we did decide at the last meeting, and I'll let Larry go into this in more detail after I'm done, but we decided we were going to be working on a six-month budget rather than trying to uh, make a budget for the whole year because things are so unpredictable. We're hoping um, things may pick up in, in terms especially of um, income and activity um, the second six months of our fiscal year. Um, we do have a challenge next month is our, um, I think, Larry, we are going to do our annual meeting. Or Next month, we have to plan for a meeting. Zoom annual meeting. Yeah. So we haven't figured out how we're going to do that yet. But I think it uh, might be pretty inviting for a lot of the, the people out there. Um, we don't usually get a real um, crowd of members to come to that annual meeting. But I think maybe we'll get some. Um, that wouldn't have normally come because we're doing it and they can stay home and uh, attend a meeting. Um, I have, the last couple months, I've been doing some outreach uh, via email and with some phone calls to get a handle on where volunteers are as far as their um, desire to come back and volunteer when the bookshop uh, reopens. And I've managed to uh, get to at least, I think, 30 of them right around that. And we're talking 98% can't wait to get back. So it was a very positive response. I think some people had made some assumption that some old people wouldn't want to come back because um, they're worried about their health. But that's, we've got a couple people who, you know, use that as a I'm undecided um, kind of reasoning. Um, one person is choosing not to come back. But um, overall, I think um, 
I've been trying to maintain some kind of communication with volunteers and, and they'll be ready to, to get back when we can. I've made it really clear it's gonna be a while. Um, it really, I have, I did send out um, the, um, the reopening plan that was developed there by the board and I've been telling people it's phase six before the actual books bookstore would be back open. Um, we're hoping in phase five um, that um, some of our uh, limited, on a limited basis, the people who usually do the scanning um, and selling of books will um, come back into the building and be following whatever the required protocols are. But if we can start doing scanning, and I think we decided also at that point, then we would be open to having the donation start again, um, that we'd have some books to scan. That has been um, you know, a, a fairly good and a constant source of income that we don't have right now, but we do need the books um, before we can start doing that. So um, that will happen, I think, before anything else, and it'll be a limited number of people at uh, designated times that will be in to um, take care of that. Um, as far as income goes, although clearly it's not where we would like it to be, um, at least you, know, you may or may not be aware, there are somewhere out there, there are some corporate matches um, um, that are happening. So we are getting um, some checks from corporations with their match. We are still getting memberships and are trying to think about a way to do some reasonable kind of outreach to remind people um, that they can still send in their membership renewal, even while the library's closed, that it's still for a good cause. Um, hey, Mitzi, I, I'm sorry, can I interrupt really quick? Sure. Um, whoever's the host, Melanie Macy's in the waiting room, if they can let her in. Sorry, Mitzi. Okay. Okay, somebody's doing that. Okay. Um, actually, well, yeah, this is really good timing because um, Melanie um, has just come on board as a lifetime member. She and her family um, have joined and we really appreciate that because that's a, I think $200 um, cost, but I'd certainly like to encourage all of you that figure you're gonna be coming to the library for life that uh, you might as well go ahead and get a, a lifetime membership. Um, I think most of the rest of what we can update you on, I'll let Larry take over and do some of the, um, updates specifically related to some numbers. Great, thank yeah. you, Mitzi. Larry, go uh, ahead. Sure, uh, well, thanks, Mitzi. Um, yeah, I think that the challenge we found with with the numbers is, I mean, it's it's very much a, the, the kind of global uncertainty everybody has about, you know, is there gonna be a baseball season? Is there, you know, the kids gonna go back? I mean, it, it's hitting everybody, so it's hitting us too. We don't know what we don't know. And um, what we do know is we aren't able to make money right now, basically, because most of our income uh, historically has been selling books in the shop or, you know, via scanning. So like Mitzi said, um, at the point where we're able to, um, I mean, when we had the book sale, when we did, it, obviously, it was fortunate that we, that we had it when we did, but what that one up uh, resulting in is our stock is quite low <laughs> happily you know, because we just have the book sale so we're you know we would be starting at this point if we were going into scan with you know a lot of leftovers but you know not much else so uh, when we get to the point where we're able to you know consider scanning books and selling books again obviously the first step is to be able, be able to have books you know and donations back in the building so that's, I mean, there's not a whole lot more to say about all that. I think we can certainly come up with a, a plan that, you know, that coincides with what the library and the city's um, requirements are in terms of, of safety, uh, in terms of how many volunteers, you know, we have in the sorting room, that sort of thing. Um, and then, you know, quarantining, quarantining uh, donations. Um, we're able to we're able to control that kind of thing pretty well because it's you know we're in the in the back room downstairs just a couple people at a time type of thing as opposed to the shop which is you know physically it's just a much smaller and enclosed area and we can't 
you know, people coming and going, it's, you know, much more unpredictable. So, um, so that's kind of where we're at with the scanning. Once, once we get to go ahead to have donations back in and then have a limited number of volunteers be allowed to be back in the building, I think we can, I think we can safely come up with a plan to, to move forward and start making money again. Um, in terms of the budget, um, I think what we talked about at our friends meeting, um, like Mitzi said, that we, it just, it made, made sense to look at it from a six month standpoint, because we just, we just don't know, we don't know next month, let alone, uh, you know, April. So, um, and, and, and obviously our budget is going to be, um, you know, we, we just don't know how, it, it's going to be confusing. It's going to be um, a little bit problematic. We do have money in the money market that we can transfer over as a starting point. I know Emily's talked about uh, some things that the city is able to do that, uh, you know, maybe can fill in the gaps. But I think our plan um, that we talked about was, um, first of all, doing a six month budget, but then also basically looking at how the 18, 19, I'm sorry, the 1920 uh, budget year ended up. Look at what the percentages were for some of the key uh, categories of, you know, basically when I say key categories, it's the library expenses, obviously. Um, so that if, let's say, adult programming wound up being, you know, that they only use 75% of what we had budgeted for a year, use that as kind of a starting point and then, you know, split that in half for the six month. And, you, it, and just use it as a starting point for discussions for our August budget. Um, and if it turns out that maybe we need to, you know, decrease this category and increase that category and just kind of, you know, rob Peter to pay Paul type of thing, uh, we, can, we can do that. But we just figured that was maybe the most logical way to, to, to start off the budget process. So that's kind of just in a nutshell, um, you know, what we've talked about as far as, you know, potential for getting back to making money and then also what our budget plans are for the next year. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there questions or comments from uh, library board members? Other friends? Carla. Um, first of all, thank you for coming. We, uh, sure. we appreciate that you guys make the effort to come and join us. Um, I have a couple questions. Um, first, um, how does your board look? Do you know, um, do you have open spots for next mm -hmm. year? Um, like some people not returning, do you already have people lined up with interest? How does that all stand? It's a really good question. I um, forgot to actually mention that. Um, everyone who's on the board is willing to come back. Um, one person, Melissa, and I can't pronounce her last name, K-A-N, Canellas. Um, she would be happy to stay on, but um, at some point she will be um, resigning and said she'd be happy to leave at whatever point we had somebody to take her place. And um, so that's kind of a potential opening, but uh, Kevin Pearson was a board member who did have to resign. And so we do have an opening there. And this is a really good audience to give that information to because we would really like to, to fill that spot. It's a different kind of board experience, I think, but many of you know um, library users and people are really interested in the, the causes that, that the friends um, support. So any suggestions anybody has would be really great. Let us know. And what's the deadline for expressing interest in the, those spots? Oh, let's say August 31st, or should we do go with before our August board meeting? Larry, what do you think? Yeah, everything is so kind of up in the air right now, probably isn't that critical, but yeah, probably the end of August, if we knew something that would be helpful. Okay, before that if possible. Yeah, basically it'd be a, still a month to go. Okay. Um, so what does your savings look like right now, your balance sheet? Cause, um, um, from what I saw, I mean, 
Uh, the last thing I saw was from a few months back, and I don't know how much you guys, you probably had quite a few expenses since I saw that, so. Well, at, as of the end of June, um, obviously this is, well, I was going to say it's fluid. It's not that fluid because <laughs> not much is happening, but it, it, there have been some changes in July. But as of the end of June, um, our checking account was uh, just over $7,300, and our savings account, our money market, uh, was about eleven thousand three, about eleven thousand three sixty. So we tentatively were thinking, you know, if we dipped into the money market half, I, you know, we're we're still just kind of playing around with that in our minds and and you know bouncing things off of Emily when we get to that point. So we're not in, you know, we're not, you know, down to, you know, two dollars and eight cents, but we're. Um, you know, as we as it stands right now, we're still okay. But obviously, with the continuation of no income, um, you know that that's going to hit hard. This can't be sustained at this at this particular level. Yeah. Right. Um, so I have one more thing. Um, the our budget committee met yesterday, and um, we were discussing about. Um, adjusting our budget so that we could fund more of the programming from our budget and um which i you know, um we'll discuss as a board a little bit later but um there were a few things that we weren't sure if we're actually allowed to pay for um like giveaway books for book clubs um which um those types of things add up to around two thousand dollars a year um, so that would be something that um, Emily's looking into it. She's checking with the city attorney um, on, you know, are we allowed to purchase those things and give, the, give them away or not? But those would be things that um, we would, if we're not allowed to do that, it might, might be very nice if you guys could continue that. Um, and so just uh, something to bring back to the friends maybe. Yeah, I think that's helpful. That would be really helpful to to know, you know, the do's and the don'ts. So the, you know, like I said earlier, if we needed to shift things around, that that would be an obvious situation where we'd want to shift to an area that you couldn't handle. And I think we um, we did have a meeting with um, Amy and Matt and Emily and and Larry and I um, to discuss the whole, you know, budget situation. And I think um, at this point, we were looking at um, the library having funds possibly enough in, in programming to cover um, to the end of the calendar year because the uh, programs are so much um, are reduced, especially when it gets into the holiday time. Um, so that's one thing that, that may be happening. Sure don't know about whether you can or cannot um, if there's restrictions on what you can purchase or not purchase. But I think when we um, have a new budget and feel like we're getting to a point where we have some money coming in, we should be able to go back to, um, we might have to be just a little more um, particular about which programs we can reimburse when, but that's certainly um, the overall goal is to be able to um, support those programs again. Thank you. Carla, did you have anything else? Okay. Any other board members? Melanie. Um, yeah, thank you both for coming. Um, I'm sorry if I missed this when it was, if it was said earlier. Um, how do Friends volunteers feel about coming back in the building? I mean, I know you're subject to the regulations that the library board has set forth, but assuming that it were allowed, would there be volunteers who would be willing to come to the building? Absolutely. I was able to give a report that uh, the, the outreach that I've done to um, shop volunteers, probably 98% are really anxious to get back. Okay. Because they know it's not going to be happening until we know it's going to be um, safe for everyone. Okay. And given the sort of uncertainty of that, has there been any talk about um, using some sort of other offsite storage and processing for these books, like getting a storage unit or something? Well, I have not. Not, 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 and he's not Larry's garage. <laughs> Yeah, last last year we had a very very um, 
healthy donation from somebody in, um, what was it, Pleasant Ridge. It was about, I forget now, 250 boxes of books. And we knew there was no way to have it stored in the library. So I figured eh, it's the summertime. Oh, I don't need to park my car in the garage. So, but I don't think I want to do that again, especially <laughs> in the COVID period. Uh, but anyway, to be serious though, we, we did talk about whether there might be alternative ways to store books somehow. I mean, the, the, the catch right now though, is that since there's no donations, um, there's nothing to store. Um, so if we get to the point where donations are, are allowed in the building uh, or are allowed somewhere, <laughs> um, then we can figure out you know, what, the <laughs> what, the, uh, what the plan could be. I was wondering too, like maybe the, if there's another spot that can be set up for donations, like your garage, sounds like an ideal spot. <laughs> but I Actually, mean, Joan possible. was volunteering hers, but we just, we weren't ready to go with that plan yet. So I'm, I feel your pain, Larry. My garage is currently full of books because I took the books out of the Keller Elementary School. We have oh, a summer okay. reading program where we distribute, and of course we didn't get a chance to do that. So um, I'm doing Wednesday distributions to families who come and we do the social distancing, so... My garage is full of books, and my garage is coming down next week. So, um, anybody want to store my books? Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> no. I just got rid of bottles, so I don't know that I want to refill my garage. <laughs> All right, <laughs> but I mean, so it just seems like there's going to be this huge backlog. I don't know about everybody else, but I have like boxes of books that are ready to donate as well. Um, it would be great if we could somehow figure out how to start working on that sooner rather than later. We do um, have the advantage that because we just had that uh, book sale. The, the shelves where we keep all the books are relatively empty. So um, once we can um, unquarantine books, because if we're doing, um, bringing them in during a time that they still need to be quarantined, um, there should be room for them. But I, it's so unpredictable uh, related to when the donations are, you know, how many donations we're gonna get, but I'm sure your feeling is correct that there's a, a big backlog. Brandon. Um, so actually kind of on this, uh, Emily, we're, we're doing a lot of weeding right now of the collection, you know, reading the staff reports. Um, we have more books than we need. So Emily, where are these extra books going at the moment? Are they just like piling up in the friends room waiting for someone to come look at them one day? Um, they're being placed on the shelves where then the friends fold them and, and do look through them after that. Okay, so so the friends inventory, I guess, is going up slightly, or, you know, somewhat. Um, Larry Mitzi, I know the couple meetings I was involved in, um, and thank you for inviting me. Um, there were discussions about that pallet service, right, where you just ship out everything you have. Someone sells the pennies on the dollar, much less money. Um, is that something you've all have considered a little bit more, just to kind of clear out some of these backlogs? We we didn't we haven't really. I mean, we've considered it. I think. Again, I think it's it's kind of the domino effect. If if we're if the donations are allowed to be taken, then hopefully then we would be able to act on what we're normally, the, the, you know, the normal way that we process the scanning and, and and sending out the books. So, I guess there's a call. You know, there's several levels. It's the acceptance of donations. Where do we store those donations? And then processing the donations. I'm confident if we get to the if if we're if we get to the point where we can process them, I'm confident we can do that safely because we can limit the number of people. So then it's just a matter of at what point are donations allowed in and where do we store them. Um, and but as Mitzi says, it's a it's a pretty open room at the moment, and um, I'm confident that we get people to start you know pro, you know looking through them uh, so that it wouldn't be a, a, a you know a huge backlog in there. The word pallet kind of scares me. I mean, pallet sounds really big. And I don't know how many books they would need at the same time. But, you know, to be truthful, we, nobody's um, done any phone call follow up yet with that organization to see, you know, what the, the regulations um, are going to be. I'll, I'll mention one other thing I forgot to mention earlier that um, uh, one of our uh, former board members, uh, Ann Barber, who mm -hmm. sells books and, um, you know, for as long as I know her, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what 
things she's sold in the past, but she's, she's an independent seller of things. Um, I'm, sure, I'm sure that's not her title. Um, but she, since she's left the board, she has taken on the responsibility of selling um, kind of special books and old books that are worth, potentially worth more than what we would get just selling them through our regular scanning process or through the shop. And she's, she's done a really great job with that. And she loves being able to do that. She's set it up real well with the post, postal uh, service. And our eBay, she sells all these on eBay. And our um, eBay sales, I'm looking at the uh, budget sheet. We, we budgeted $750 of income for that. And we're at $2,200 for the year. So, you know, not enormously over, but, you know, ni a, nice, mm -hmm. a nice chunk of change. So her idea was that given that the shop is going to obviously be closed longer than presumably our scanning process would be, that she would take on more books that maybe she wouldn't have in the past, but even if it's a five, six dollar book, we don't typically sell those kinds of uh, books by scanning, that we, you know, drop off a load, you know, a box of books with her at her house every couple of weeks, every month, whatever it winds up being. And she's happy to continue doing that. It's a little bit. It's not a, a huge addition, but it's it's a way to maybe um, supplement the loss of the the shop sales. But again, we need donations. And that I bring that up because when we talked about the pallet and just you know just putting a, a you know load of books without necessarily looking at them, uh, I'd be concerned that we'd be potentially you know just donating books that have higher value. So. I don't know that we have tons of those as people who've scanned Mark and Roxanne and Mitzi know that we, most of the stuff that we've scanned are not big sellers, but some, some come through. Some do. There, okay. there are gems. Yeah. yeah. Um, Mitzi, I need the name of the cat, please, for the notes. <laughs> <laughs> I've just been so impressed that there's no kids that have appeared, but Bella, B-E-L-L-A. -L -L Mine are in the <laughs> bathtub. Like give them time. Too long. <laughs> what? I said, my kids are in the bathtub. Give them about 15 minutes. You'll see them scamper by. <laughs> okay. Yeah, she's getting a little impatient. Oh, there she goes. Okay, she's gone. Um, so I'll ask you, um, are you currently funding any programming or, or was that no, not at not the moment? I don't know, Larry. When's well, the last I mean, time we wrote a check? I think we... We're still, still, being, we're, we're some still getting some. Um, it's mostly youth. Um, we, we did a, a large, let's see, in May, we reversed uh, quite a number of, of uh, programmings, you know, th uh, people that have canceled, uh, or that the library canceled. Um, so there was a, a big reversal, well, I'm looking at about, about $2,500 in reversal. Um, but there's been things that have come in. Um, I mean, Emily can speak to it. It's a lot of the programming. In some ways, it didn't look like it changed a whole lot. Um, but I, I think it, it'll wind up being down for the year. Oh, but, yeah, no, of course. Yeah. But we, yeah, we've continued. We've, we still had enough that we could continue to fund what, you know, what, uh, what few programs we were sprinkling in, in, you know, June and July. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I'm wondering if Larry or Mitzi have any questions of us or anything that you want clarified or any concerns you'd like to raise that you're thinking about. I've got a couple. You may have this on your agenda for later. Just um, um, updates on where you are as far as phases, what you can tell as far as what's happening in the future. And the only other one is related to your decision to um, not budget for the um, renovation of the library and what the reason, reasoning was for that. The um, easy answer to the last one is we are revisiting the renovation question uh, later on in the agenda. The quick overview of that is when it was time to turn our budget in, things were really, really unknown and we could not possibly justify a $700,000 expenditure. Um, and now that we know a little bit more and are starting to understand how pieces of our renovation can actually help 
um, in our COVID world. Um, we're going to discuss tonight possibilities of a phased in renovation. So it's not that we're taking it off the table totally. We still want to do it and plan on doing it. The question is how and when and in what order. So that's the short answer to your, your okay. last question. Um, and let's see, Mark. Yeah, let's see. The other thing is uh, back in March, we thought we might be looking at a half million dollar repair of our roof. And uh, since that time, we've had additional inspections and um, uh, have found that we may be able to extend the life of the roof for several years, maybe up to five years. And so that's not on the table in an immediate sense. And uh, so that also um, was a factor uh, along with the uncertainty in our decision. Good point, Mark. Yes, that was a big conversation all at the same time. Brandon. Um, so I'll move to the opening really quick, um, and I'll just say that, I mean, I think Mitzi, none of us, I mean, we've talked about this, no one has a crystal ball, we don't know. Um, if more people wore a mask, maybe it would be open a little bit sooner, but um, we're still sticking to that the next phase happens along the time that Michigan moves to its next phase. Um, and I, you know, who knows, who knows when that's going to happen. Right. So I, I, I don't think anyone has a feeling, but we're so pretty. Um, I mean, uh, Emily is getting the library ready for it internally. We're getting the barricades up. We're adding um, wash stations, a welcome station. I mean, Emily and the staff are doing everything that they need to so that when we're ready to go to the next phase, when the state moves into its next phase, mm -hmm. the library is also going to be ready to advance um, if it's safe. So I did uh, watch the uh, Whitmer press conference today and she didn't, I don't think moving from any phase to another phase was even on, was even covered. So um, yeah. you we know, are I, where we are. Yeah, if you remember back in June, I, I think there's some optimism that by July we'd be in the next phase and yeah. you know, the, the numbers are just where they are and it remains number one is the public safety, it's the safety of uh, the patrons, of the staff and everyone in between, so. Uh, we're just we're gonna stick that's why we have the plan uh it's you know that's why we share it with you and it, mm -hmm. it's, it's if we had the plan we know that this is the next step so there's really no guesswork thanks did we miss any of your questions mitzi reopening renovation mm -hmm. was there a third thing you asked nope those were the two big ones okay any other questions for the board from or the only thing I had, I mean, and I, it kind of goes, I think, to what Brandon just explained was, and we've talked about this with the friends group, friends board, was the the phase four um, comment under the volunteers where it says minimum is authorized, requires board policy change. So there's, you know, a little bit of wiggle room there. Um, obviously, that's, that's phase four, and we're not at phase four yet. But... Um, is there, do, do, does the board have a sense of what would be allowed to get, you know, minimize as authorized, minimum as authorized, what would that mean uh, according to the board? Brandon. Um, so I think Emily could really speak best to this one probably because Emily is the, she put together this spreadsheet, we just helped a little bit. Emily is the one who sat down and meticulously typed it out but um, from my discussions and my ideas is in that early phase before we have opened up the sorting room to take donations, that is allowing you all to come in if you need to collect items that were there that are existing, you know, maybe one or two people in the building just to pick up loose ends. If you have mail that comes in, if you need, you know, the, you guys do a lot in the building um, and it's making sure right now we're in a phase where we're not allowing um, of any sort. I, I think delivery personnel aren't even allowed in. So it's, we're really focused on limiting the amount of contacts and touches. Um, so uh, I, I think that's what it means by uh, minimal. Um, it's not someone coming in and sorting and using, you know, going through books, coming in to pick up loose ends. Correct. Okay. okay. And we have staff in the building, of course, working. So it's another, we're trying to keep it as, um, you know, that bubble as tight as possible right now, because they, they are there. Um, serving the public through contactless pickup. Right. Okay. Um, Emily, did you want to add anything to the um, 
thinking around when the volunteer, when it might make sense for volunteers to. Uh, I think Brandon summarized it well, that really, I think it'll kind of take some adjusting and um, just taking care of the stuff that's already in the building. So I think that when uh, we do hit phase four, that may be a good time to start bringing in some of the volunteers just to take care of that initial stuff. Like we had a period, kind of this buffer period where we just had staff in the building and that was pretty valuable um, just because there there is a lot of catch up work after being out for so long that needs to be done. Okay, thank you. Hope that helps. Yep, thank you. Melanie. I just have a question for them. The technology that you use, like the scanner for the books, um, it's in the library. Is it something that could be portably removed somewhere else? It could be. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, and again, that kind of goes back to the, you know, where do we physically store books? I can, I could be scanning right now on a computer. I mean, it's just a matter of logging into uh, a couple different um, uh, software that we use or websites that we use you know, logging in a password and, and then scanning. So that can be done anywhere. There, there's nothing special about that. What's what's special about the sorting room is we have a giant table yeah. and we can make, you know, a dozen different piles. And, you know, this this buyer has a minimum of this amount before you have to pay shipping and this one has a different amount. And so it's, it sometimes becomes a an organizational task rather than just boxing up books. And that would be Needless to say, pretty pretty challenging in, in somebody's house. So, okay. Has your board um, talked a little a little bit about your procedures that you would put in place um, for the scanning process? Like how long the donations will be quarantined? For, you know those sorts of things. Have you started putting that plan together yet for yourselves? Well, I I haven't done anything formally. I mean, I've jotted mm -hmm. down notes. You know, uh, I think certainly we'd want to. Well, we'd be required, and it would make sense to follow what the library and the state um, rules are. Um, I think, you know, in my mind, because the scanning operation is, you know, it's, you know, it's got a, I've already forgotten how many computers we have in there. Four, four computers, or three computers. <laughs> Jeez, that's been too long. Um, but they're, you know, they're spaced out in a way that I figured, you know, maximum maybe two people at that area wearing masks. You know the, the the obvious things that everybody should be doing, um, but I I feel confident that you know once things are quarantined at whatever the accepted um, you know three days five days whatever it is um, that basically if if it's one or two people focused on scanning and boxing that that process can be done pretty safely. I think we'd we'd probably want to do more of a scheduling kind of situation in the past. It, you know, we're volunteers. We come in when our schedule makes sense. Mm -hmm. I typically come in at a certain time, but I don't know whatever day it makes sense, you know, you know, based on my work schedule, that sort of thing. So we'd probably need to change that so that we didn't suddenly have 10 people, you know, showing up at once. Um, so I think, you know, certainly be, I think it'd be easy enough to come up with a plan once, once we have something to sell. Right. And then I put the yesterday you were talking about the um, guidelines the library is currently using for quarantine circulated items. Could you talk a little a little bit about that now? About why 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 you what is it ninety seventy two hours or ninety? Um, how many hours are you quarantining? Yeah, so there's a big study going on in Ohio called the Realm Project. And they're studying library materials in particular because that was kind of a questionable area. We really didn't get a lot of hard data from the CDC initially. I mean, they only were seeing um, 48 hours. Um, so this project has focused just on library materials, in particular stacked papers and like cardboard board books and things like that and um, DVDs, like the plastic cases. And I think they just went through their second round of testing. And what they found is with the stack paper, the virus was found to live on the surface for 96 hours, where previously we thought it was only 72. Um, libraries were advised kind of just to, you know, the, the Library of Michigan advised us that we could kind of make a decision if we wanted to be extra safe and quarantine longer. And we decided to, as well as most of the libraries um, in the area, at least. Um, so we are now, we bumped it up to a 96 hour quarantine. 
How much space is in the room where you have your books currently in quarantine? Well, it's the auditorium. So how we have it is we just have different tables separating everything with dates on it so that we know when they were returning and then they sit there for the four days. So it's a pretty spacious area um, and it's a pretty organized, like well-oiled operation going on in there. So I would, I would say there's a decent amount of space, but um, not, I wouldn't say a ton to store donations or anything like that. Because mm-hmm. I'm, um, actually, I think Stacy just gave me an idea as far as our agenda for our next board meeting, just in terms of the planning, and certainly it would be, it would in, include what areas we have in our um, storage uh, room to do that quarantining, and then to just, you know, go ahead and maybe um, write out some additional planning for just finding out which of the scanners are willing to come back and what kind of schedule that we might be able to do with them so that we're ready. It's a great idea. I know people are anxious for like normalcy too. It might feel like we're moving in the right direction to have a plan, right? That feels Mm -hmm. good. Yeah, you're right. (laughs) Anything else? Oh, now we have another cat. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Dueling cats. (laughs) The library. Um, Anything else? for the good of our joint meeting. Thanks again for coming and You're joining welcome. us. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. Now you are welcome to stay if you'd like, or you mm-hmm. could just go if you want to. We won't, we will not be offended. <laughs> okay. It's completely up to you. All right. Thank okay. You. Thanks, Thanks for all. Nice Thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay, we're gonna move on to um, Committee and liaison reports, which is our next item is policy review. We do have a couple policies um, amendments that we're going to vote on later in our action items. And there is a policy review committee report in the board packet. So what I'm going to do is open it up to board members to ask any questions they might have of the policy review committee. Thanks again, by the way, for continuing to meet policy review committee. You guys have been busy. Um, actually, I'll just add really quick. Uh, right. One thing that didn't make this report, we had a quick discussion on um, director emergency power and if it was uh, the right time to maybe start changing that or take a look at it. And the uh, committee unanimously agreed that it was not something that we were interested in changing at the moment as we continue to move forward with a unknown uh, reopening. Great. Thanks for clarifying that. Any questions for policy review? Okay, we thank you again for your work. Next, facilities. Wow, you guys have been meeting too. (laughs) Um, Thank you, by the way, Mark, for the report you submitted. It's really valuable for keeping us all informed, but also in the record for later on. So I think it's really good to have this history of what's going on with that roof, for instance. so first of all, any highlights you'd like to make from the report? And then, um, and I think Emily, you might have, do you have an update about, I felt like there were phone calls that maybe happened after this report to someone. Uh, was it the roof work? I don't know if that was included. The roof, um, yeah. the roof work has partially been done. They just need to finish okay. up a, a few things, but they okay. were extremely quick. Like I hadn't, I had called Joe and he contacted Firestone who set their, sent their people out to do the work and they were in at 7 a.m. I actually got a call from DPS that I guess they've gone to the police station to try to get in. So um, luckily Mike from DPS was around and he let them in, but I couldn't believe how quickly they came over <laughs> the next day. That's great. Yeah. Um, are there questions from board members about the facilities? committee report or clarifications you might want. Mark. I don't have anything to add to the report, but I would just point out that the second item is a discussion item on our agenda. So I know Carla and uh, on behalf of the budget committee and myself on behalf of facilities may have remarks at that point. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Is there another? Okay. The cat is there. Melanie has a cat. So many cats tonight. That's wants to be fed. <laughs> I, I called mine over to join the fun. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> um, okay. Go I, I just want to say it's pretty cool. <laughs> GPS came over so fast, right? Like we've been working on a better relationship with GPS and maintaining the building. So, you know, if GPS is listening, thank you for uh, working with us. GPS is awesome. They help us out with so much. And, you know, I just, I contact them and they're immediately over. Music to my ears. <laughs> All right, next, budget. We had a meeting yesterday and there is a report in your packet um, that lays out the big items that we talked about. Um, are there questions from board members about the report? Um, there were just a couple things I wanted to highlight. Um, there's nothing to vote on today, um, but we are expecting to get numbers from the city um, in the next month, hopefully, um, and at which point we were going to revisit the budget and make adjustments as needed, which we mentioned that to you guys a couple months ago. Um, so we're approaching that point. Um, but um, there's also, there was the feedback from the friends that they were probably not going to be able to help very much with programming expenses. And so there's the notes in there about that the budget committee um, felt confident that we could express to staff that um, we would be able to increase what we had. We had $10,000 on the programming line um, in the budget that we approved. Um, we were pretty confident that um, the board would approve to increase that to 20, so an, an additional 10,000, um, and potentially more, depending on what they plans they bring forward of what type of programming that they are envisioning. Um, so I hope that that's not um, an overstretch from those of you who are not on the budget committee that we um, communicated through Emily that um, they could definitely plan on an extra 10,000, um, but bring us a plan and then we'll figure out exactly how much we're looking to add on. So. And then to just further clarify um, Carla's point she just made, normally about 33,000 is spent in programming between youth and adult, is that correct? Traditionally, the is that right, 33,000? Uh, last year it was 33,000, yeah. So, um, Traditionally, the, the friends have played, paid for 100% of programming and it does not show up in our budget. So the $10,000 was what was the library's contribu contribution um, because of falling, falling revenue that um, friends were experiencing pre-COVID. So we figured going to 20,000 was safe considering normally it's a 33, they usually have $33,000 to work with or last year they did. So that's a little more context for that. Thanks for bringing up those points, Carla. Uh, any questions? Okay, next, uh, DDA, Emily. Okay, so the item that I think is very relevant to us is they were discussing parking. And right now the DDA has paid for free parking in the structures through July. So the question is whether they want to continue through August. Um, what was really interesting about this, though, is the discussion started to veer into what's going to happen after all of this. Like, how long does this continue for? What will the DDA continue to cover? And they brought up the idea that they may end up um, covering or looking into two hours of free parking all day, which I am all in favor of. I think that would solve all of our 5 p.m. problems once we do reopen. Um, so how they left it is right now they are for sure going to cover August and then they're going to have a, um, they have some subcommittees that are going to be discussing it, but they're looking at starting a two to three members of the DDA meeting with two to three members of the city commission to address the parking issues. Um, this was all in response to a public comment um, from, I think it's a business owner downtown. So I'm just happy that this issue is getting addressed and that, you know, there's um, hopefully good things on the horizon because when we do reopen, that's always a continued problem is the 5 p.m. flat fee. Um, that was really um, the only issue that specifically pertained to the library. That is excellent news, Emily. 
I was thrilled. <laughs> okay. Um, if only someone would have made that comment in the past somewhere somehow. Right? <laughs> Word. Okay. Next. Uh, liaisons for August. City Commission, August 10th, August 24th. Um, the question is, is there anything we'd want to, the board would want to raise to the City Commission? Brandon. Actually, I'll let Melanie go first, if that's okay. Melanie. Oh, what were you going to say about the library porch? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I guess this must have been at the facilities meeting. Um, Emily shared with us the 90% plan for the park, for the downtown park, that includes now um, a, like the, the library porch. So the part that's facing the park, um, the right now is basically just like have an open area and a walkway um, and has, and now has a design kind of like a, some overlapping, I don't, know, I don't know what to call them because they're not really shelters, but some kind of structure above them that you can place tables yeah. underneath. Uh, so I, I don't know that I was, I'm not sure if I was alone in my reaction, but I think I was definitely had the strongest reaction to these structures, which is they're, they're like funnel shaped. I don't know if Emily can share it with you, but they're not. So I had thought that they were going to be overlapping like oak leaves, but instead it's like a leaf wrapped up like a funnel. And so to me, that gives neither shade nor protection from, you know, rain or snow or sun or anything. So, um, and I did, in fact, email um, the people, like, at the city who I, I think had been at the meeting and were involved and said, you know, just FYI, I have a lot of questions about this. And when it comes in front of the city commission, I'm going to have those same questions. Uh, but I'm willing to listen to, you know, reasons that this would be. This is a good idea. Um, and Aaron Flipsky responded and said he's happy to talk to me. Like there was some design thought that went into this. Um, we haven't had that conversation yet. But anyway, I think it might be worth it if other people feel the same way that I do for someone from the library board to come to city commission when that's up, which I don't know when that's going to be yet, but I think it's soon uh, and kind of give our take on it. Emily? I did just want to update you too. Aaron and I had a conversation following our meeting. And um, he reached out to MKSK, and they are going to be doing a presentation that will include the library board members so you can see the design. With the idea, though, at this point, it is at the 90% phase, so I don't know if changes will be able to be made. Can you clarify a presentation? It's to the board? Well, um, to the board and other stakehold stakeholders, but um, they just wanted to share what was going on. And um, he said to make sure that the library board was included in that. Do you have any idea when that meeting might take place? I do not. They just said that they'll, they'll reach out to us when they're ready for it. Okay. Brandon? Um, so I think my comment around this, and I made this during the committee meeting that we discussed this, is um, we've had no input or very little input at that. In fact, the meeting that they were talking about the final design and finalizing it, Emily wasn't invited to, and she was in the facilities committee meeting as it was happening. So we saw the final design as they were approving it internally. Um, I, it's, it's very pertinent to the library and what's impacting us. It's our front porch. Um, so I, I think my comment would be that, it, that we had not been consulted in a meaningful way. Um, I will say too, that was an oversight that I didn't, I, MKSK had sent out the invitations and they had forgotten to me, include me and I think somebody else too. They sent, they did send out the invite, but at that point I was um, committed to the facility committee meeting because I got it that day. Um, yeah, but I, even if, yeah. I, I'm sorry, but even if at that point they were presenting the 90% completion product. I like, had been, I'd been in on these six, I think it was at 60% at that point too. That was during the closure. Um, so that was, you know, I had reached out to Aaron and expressed the concerns. That was the point where we thought they were going to get rid of the butterfly garden, um, you know, put the electrical box right outside the library. So I got to be in on the 60% um, meeting where they did present the, the canopy design. And then we got to give feedback, like, you know, I mean, there is, we expressed concerns about the design, whether it was going to um, cause water to pool and flood down on people and things like that. And, um, you know, that we would like it to be more shade producing, um, possibly more coverage producing too. So I did get to see the design and give some input on it too. So I just didn't want it to be that we are completely left out of the process. Um, 
And I will say, I, I think a big part of that is having Aaron Filipski has been a really great working relationship as far as being included, because I can't say that I think if it was somebody else in it, we may have had any input at all. So. Well, I think uh, the facilities committee was of one mind that we should have had more input, but I don't think we were of one mind with regard to the aesthetics and functional aspects of the new terrace and the canopy. Um, I know Melanie has strong feelings about it, um, but um, there wasn't uh, unanimity in, in that regard. In the committee. Melanie. Yeah, that's right. I, I think Mark was, um, I, I was going off and I think Mark, I couldn't tell if Mark was on the same page or not, but in any case, I knew he wasn't as passionate. Um, but I think, so, I mean, when Emily says that this is almost a done deal because it's a 90% design, <laughs> I don't know. I feel like well, we're not going to pay them to put this in if we don't like it, right? I, I don't know. So uh, I guess I'm skeptical that they can't make changes at this point point to a design like there's nothing's been nothing that's bought or paid for as far as I know or if, if so then not with our money um, so I, I don't know I, f I feel like I'd, I'd like to hear the board's input in general when we get this presentation and I think we should feel free to push back even if there's a sense that it's kind of a done deal because it shouldn't be at this point a done deal uh, but I did also want to say that MKSK won an award for their park design. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else saw that, but there's some like planning program that gives out awards for designs and they won an award for this design. So, I mean, not, this, not just the funnels, but like the whole park. <laughs> um, you know, the other thing I want to say too is I did not sell the design well, because I don't have um, the vision that when the um, designer was talking to us and he gave us the whole story behind the design of the canopies, it's actually really beautiful. It has to do with, it's supposed to look like an oak leaf curled up in the side. So I don't know if I sold it as well. When you hear the story, it does make a more compelling case and you do see the beauty of the design. So I think it'll be good if the board can hear that and hear what the inspiration is behind it. <laughs> Brandon. And I think that's a really good point to the fact that the board hasn't talked to the designers or the people designing something on our front porch and at the night of some point. So that's, I, um, and to Mark's point also, uh, the facilities committee was split 50-50 actually on the design of the funnel and the leaf, if you like to or not. Um, was there any conversation about what this does in terms of obscuring any views from the windows? Because that has implications for our sort of vision for reworking the space inside and what people will see. Do we know anything about what it'll look like looking out from our windows? I don't think it obscures. No, and I, I told him to be aware of that, that we wanted to make sure that the views were still kept open. Okay, well, it sounds to me like the board does not have a position on this, I'm not hearing any motions or anything like this. So, and it sounds like the facilities committee did not have a particular recommendation because there was not an agreement. Melanie. I, mean, I think this is just about whether or not we have anything to say to city commission. And I was saying maybe if the board sees this and design and has, does have something, we could take it to city commission. That was just a thought. I don't know. It sounds like we would have to first see the design and then have a conversation as a board about it to sort out whether or not I mean, if anything. Um, so Emily, you'll keep us apprised of this upcoming session. Absolutely. Um, take a look at the design. Thanks, Emily. So it sounds like we don't have anything right now that we want to go before the commission with um, August 10th or August 24th. Melanie. I would say only if there's maybe an update on um, our phase, but Almost even if there's not, have we been in front of the city commission to say this is the phase we're in right now? I don't think we have, have we? No. I mean, so I'm happy to make the announcement of city commission, but if also someone wants to, to do that as well, may, that's another thing that I think might make sense is to just kind of get it out there because um, there's a bigger audience for that meeting presumably than this one. Okay, that sounds like maybe would someone from policy review like to go and just update the commission on where we are and explain, maybe there's something to explain about contactless pickup or something. 
Um, Brandon, I saw your hand. Was that a yes? Yeah, I mean, as a chair, I'd be happy to go. Okay, great. And then just check in with Emily and you guys can maybe sort out the talking points that make the most sense by then, because who knows where we'll be by then. Emily? Well, I was going to say, too, um, probably announcing, or is the city commission meeting going to happen before the August 11th closure? Or not closure, but server down? It's right before it, I think. August 10th. Yeah, it might be good because I'm just trying to get the word out about the alternative phone numbers to as many places as I can. So that might be a good place to announce that too. Emily, are you able to do August 10th to explain that? You'll have the most clear information about that and you don't want to mess it up and miscommunicate sure. um, on that one. Thank you, Emily. That makes sense. Thanks for thinking of that. And Carla? Isn't it just calling in the day before anyway? That's what I was going to ask. Is it just public comment? I would think that we could probably be, in this case, added to the call. I mean, they've done that for other committees. And you can, can just bring us there. I can address that if you don't mind. Oh, hey, girl. Uh, yeah. Oh, hi. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I can address this. Uh, we have a meeting on August 10th, right before the shutdown, and then another one currently scheduled for August 24th, which is going to be really difficult to do because we're not gonna have any access to anything to prep that meeting. So I would highly recommend that you do the August 10th meeting. And what I can do is put you directly before public comment to give an update. Um, so if two or three of you even wanted to speak on different aspects, I'm more than happy to do that. And then that way, if we do happen to have a massive amount of public comment again for any reason, you, it won't take a lot of your time. I think it's most efficient. That would be great, Carol. So right. August Stop. 10th, directly before public comment, Emily can give the update on the phones and what have you. I don't know, Brandon, if you also want to talk about um, where we are at phase opening or just leave it to Emily to do all in one sort of message. Uh, you know, Emily and I could talk about it. We could figure it out how to okay. deliver this best. Okay, you two uh, coordinate and then let Carol know if it's both of you or one of you. Thank you, Carol. That's helpful. Okay, uh, next we have uh, four action items. The first is Chromebook parameters, which is um, included in your packet. Um, it's on page, oh, they're not numbered really. 37, I think, is what my PDF thing is saying. It's right after the um, facilities. No, it's right after the budget report. So action item A, is there a motion? Um, I, think I move acceptance. OK, Brandon's motions. Second. Mark seconds. Discussion. Um, so I'm really excited for Chromebooks to be entering into our uh, distribution. We've added these. Um, I forget which committee came up with this or which committee, where these gone from, but um, we're just trying to bridge the gap of not having a computer lab open, right? We have a lot of people that need, that rely on our computer lab for their internet access. Um, and Emily and her staff have come up with these, this great solution and they come with hotspots. So um, we're making sure that public who might not have it has it, or if you're going on vacation and just want to take a hotspot with you, why not? Like, you know, we're, we're making sure access continues for all. And how many Chromebooks do we have with hotspots, Emily? Um, so we started with initial order of, I believe it is 15. And I just filled out a grant um, to get an additional 20. That's great. So yeah, hopefully that, that goes through. Okay. One thing I did want to note is, you know, we had talked about it and we were um, saying that we think we should separate out the hotspots from the Chromebooks, but make a note on the Chromebooks that hotspots are available for checkout too. So I don't have it included as part of like a package, but mm -hmm. the idea that they Not everyone would need it. So that makes a lot of sense. I agree with that. Uh, Carla. Um, I just wanted to double check, is the checkout period the same on this as it is for the hotspots? We changed yep. it a couple times, I couldn't remember. Yeah, yeah. Brandon. I think I should mention too, um, we are, uh, the due dates have been changed on all materials to September 13th, I believe, Emily, correct me if I'm wrong. September 30th. 30th, yeah, so we have months to bring back items. That does not include this item, it's excluded. Um, Chromebooks will still be back, due back, um, as per this policy. That was going to be my question. 
Any other comments, questions? Okay, all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? Let the record reflect that this motion was adopted unanimously. Okay, next we have action item B, which is amendments to policies 8.113 and 8.114, which is on the next page of your packet. Um, is there a motion? Uh, I move to accept 8.113 and 8.114. Okay, is there a second? Melanie seconds? Discussion. I would like to leave the discussion off as soon as I write down that Melanie and I uh, second moved and second that. You're still doing the notes even though Melanie came. That's nice. I know. Offered. She did offer. That's nice. Okay. Um, so 8113, 8114 were the big discussion items that we had at our policy review committee meeting this month, and you probably read about it in the report. Um, to summarize it, during our last board meeting, um, there was a very good discussion about how to move between phases, how to move forward, um, and who should have that power. And um, we talked with Emily about this, we discussed it as a committee, and we thought the best move at this point was to make this a board decision. Uh, moving forward is never something that is of the essence, of time is of the essence. It's something that, um, that we can take a little bit more time on to make sure we do it right. So this way, uh, the decision is taken away from Emily exclusively. She will suggest it. She will write a report to us, letting us know why she suggests moving forward, what items have been completed in the library, um, you know, on that checklist. And then uh, we would be able to vote as a board to move forward. Most importantly, though, she will still be able to go backwards without the vote of the board. Um, and that is when times of the assets, when if there is an outbreak, if we move back as a phase as a state, Emily retains that ability to move backwards. Um, so it's just moving forward, uh, we will, as this body, uh, consider that. Great, thanks, Brandon. Other um, comments on the amendments? Carla. Um, so two things. One is I'm just wondering um, just so that we're all clear, if we, if the state were to go into stage five, um, right after one of our board meetings, so it's a whole month before our next meeting, um, and, you know, the library felt like, Emily felt like we were ready to move forward to the next phase, um, are we, what would be the procedure, can, can we call a special meeting so that we can, we can have an emergency meeting with this as our only agenda item with 24 hours notice. Okay. Um, and then my other thing was, um, I felt like a lot of the discussion at the last meeting with the amendments dealt with the very last phrase in that second, in the 8 11 4, the within at least 24 hours. Um, that that's just confusing the way it's written. It's, is it within 24 hours, right? Like she has to notify us within 24 hours of making that move downward or the downgrade, right? Is that yes. what that means? So that's the language we decided on last month. Um, um, that she, least, she Charlotte? moves. What well, it's, yeah, can we remove the at least? Because in 24 hours of regressing. Within 24 hours, she needs to notify us, right? Yeah, I agree. Okay. So that would be my, my, uh, is it an amendment? My yeah. motion for an amendment to 8.11.4 to remove the words at least. Okay, is there a second for that? And Roxanne second. Roxanne is happy to second that. Yes, Discussion. that was why I was just going to bring that up, that at least was crazy. <laughs> Discussion. Okay, all in favor. We're just talking, oh, Mark. Yes? Um, just a, a point of order. Um, I think if the maker of the original motion um, accepts it as a friendly amendment, um, then I don't think the body has to act on it. Okay, Brandon, is this a friendly amendment to remove at least? 
you know, Carla, you've been, this is uh, two months of talking about this at least, and I'm happy to take it out. <laughs> I wasn't sure what you were going to say. Okay, so friendly amendment. I think uh, Melanie has to agree also, but yeah. You, oh, in a second has to agree. Okay, so, and you agree too. Okay, so imagine the words at least are not there. That's the policy we're talking about. Okay, other discussion about the policy. Okay, all in favor of adopting 8113, 8114 as amended, say aye. 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 All opposed? Let the record reflect that this motion was adopted unanimously. Good teamwork there. Okay. Next, we have action item C, which is <laughs> amendments to policies five point, et cetera. Okay, bunch of fives. So that's also on the next page. Um, is there a motion? Brandon is making a motion. Yes, I'm. Please. And is there a second? Melanie is a second. Okay, discussion. Brandon, you want to start? Sure. Um, so these are just kind of some more cleanup items. Uh, you know, every month we kind of change a little here and there. Um, so 5105, uh, this one came from Adrian because we don't, uh, just silly stuff, like we don't actually ask someone their library card number. They can identify themselves in any way as long as the librarian can verify it. So um, we're just taking some old wording out. Another change is uh carl has changed from six to seven days so we we're just changing our policy to reflect what technology can handle and then one of the last changes is changing we had originally called it curbside pickup when it's actually contactless pickup so these are all um, put them all three together because they're pretty uh uncontroversial okay and you re removed website because that's not an option it's that's not right yeah. okay any other discussion Uh, all in favor of these amendments as proposed, say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, let the record reflect that this motion was adopted unanimously. Okay, next we have um, our fourth action item, which um, has to do with our calendar. Um, COVID has impacted our calendar. So, um, Carla, I believe, has a motion for us. Um, I motion that we make changes to our calendar. I don't have it written here, sorry. Uh, our 2020 calendar of operations um, to remove a closure date, the ones around the Friday of Labor Day, right? Is it just the Friday, Emily? Yeah, yeah. we'll still okay. be closed the Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Okay, so that is my motion. Okay, is there a second? Does anyone have that date in front Emily of them? is a second. The, she sent the thing, but I'm afraid if I go there that I will um, lose this. Let me see if I can do it. It's okay, I'll, I'll go back, I'll find it. I think it's the fourth. It's the fourth. Okay, the fourth. Thank you. Um, discussion. Maybe, Emily, you can tell us what's happening on that Friday. Yeah, so normally, historically, that's our in-service day. Um, it's kind of a weird day because our Pizza and Eats, when it happens, um, we would have to pay like $20 for parking. So how we've handled it in the past is we've just been closed to the public and um, the staff, however, it's not a holiday for them. So that's when we would try to hold our in-service. Um, I had not even thought about that because I'm like, what's reality anymore? <laughs> what's open? What's closed? And I was glad that Carla brought that up because really um, it's good to have that out there so it doesn't confuse the public um, and um, that our calendar is accurately reflecting, reflecting that we are in fact open and we're going to be business as usual as far as our contactless pickup. So the reason it will be open is because Art Speeds and Eats is canceled this year. Yes. Okay. Brandon. Emily, during those in-services, um, was staff there all day? Yes. Uh, until what time? Oh, like we would 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock? Yeah, 9 to 6. Okay. Carla? Um, 
it might be something, Brandon or Emily, to mention at the uh, city commission thing that we will be open. Thank you. Melanie? Um, this is only kind of vaguely related in that it's calendar related, but I didn't know where else to say it on the agenda. But now when Carol said that about how the, the 24th uh, city commission date was going to be a challenge because it was going to be hard to put anything together um, since the computers were going to be shut down up until that point, it made me wonder about our meeting as well. Um, and I, it doesn't seem like we should maybe shift our meeting. Um, and then also, if we're going to have MKSK come and give us a presentation, is that something we could do as like maybe that date or another one? Um, I'm just thinking about the agenda packet and putting that together. And if, is that going to be possible if the computers are shut down during that time? You make a fabulous point. Um, and we um, probably shouldn't talk about it during the discussion of this because it's not about the, it's not germane to the um, motion, but thanks for raising it and we will talk about it maybe in a minute <laughs> after we start this out. Okay, any other discussion about uh, correcting the day that the closure calendar to reflect that, to remove September 4th because we'll actually be open in whatever phase we're in. We'll be open because our business is closed. Um, all in favor? Uh, Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, let the record reflect that this motion was adopted unanimously. Okay, discussion items. Uh, we had a friends update, which has been moved. So now um, server outage, maybe this might be a time in a discussion to talk about with the server, you know, with how that might impact our board meeting in August. Okay, so Emily, you um, put a... Um, uh, a little bit of background on this, but and in the meantime, you've had some conversations. So could you tell us a little bit about the server outage situation? Sure. So when City Hall moves across the street to their new building, part of this is um, that they have to take the server down for a period. The worst case scenario um, is that it will be between August 11th and 19th. Now talking to Mike, he said that they are adding some days in as kind of a cushion. He really hopes and expects it won't, they won't need to take that long. Um, but I definitely think we should plan for the worst case scenario. What this will mean for us and all the other city buildings that um, rely on the city server or connected to it is we will have no phones, um, no internet, um, no shared drives, and then all of the applications that the city hosts for us will be unavailable. For our purposes, that means that the staff can't get onto the computers where we have Carl already installed. Um, all we have available is the public computers, which don't have Carl on them. Um, we would still be able to run my Libro because that's web-based. Um, but our phones where we take our scheduling for the contactless pickup and any other questions that patrons call in with would be down. All that we'd have is the runner phone, the monitor phone, and now just talking to Mike, we are gonna have two other phones available so we can create lines for those. Um, we have Carl Connect, which is like a remote version of Carl. However, it's we call it Carl Lite because it's really more for checking patron information than it is for actually doing the heavy duty stuff that Carl does, like um, checking in books and checking out books is the biggest thing, placing holds. It can't do the things like that. Um, so that's not a great option because at first I was thinking, well, maybe we can set people up with tablets like we did during the closure. But um, for actually handling the materials, we would definitely need our regular Carl X. So Ed and I have been working on a plan to get Carl installed on the public computers. It actually, um, with social distancing in mind, it leaves about seven different stations that we could have open with Carl on it. Um, we will still have the Wi-Fi available too. Um, so that was some good news. I, you know, we've been back and forth with Mike Kirby about our options and, um, I felt a little better once I heard that the police station, because they're going to obviously keep their 911 emergency line up, but for non-emergency calls, they also have to go to an alternative number. So they just already started promoting that. And it kind of got me thinking that with the critical calls they take, if they can still stay up and running and have a system for promoting it, I really feel like we will be able to do this. Um, so I 
my thing is I did want to try to maintain services as much as possible because I didn't want to shut down anything when we've already been closed for three months, if possible. Um, I'm pretty confident that with the stations that we can run Carl on once we get that set up with TLN and the additional phones, I think we can keep our contactless pickup service going strong during this time. Um, we're also not doing any programming. Not that it really would have impacted programming that much online, but um, we don't have any programming going on that time too. So that's kind of good timing. Um, the rest of the staff, well, the big thing is too, we want to make sure that we're keeping the Carl computers for the access services department who are going to be handling the books. The rest of the staff, what we're going to be done doing is if they really wanted to weed during that time, we can create lists, a shelf reading list um, where they don't have to scan the books. They can just look on the list and see, um, you know, what the circulation stats are. And there's a lot of kind of just hands-on projects that don't know, they don't always have the time to do that we've discussed and it'll be a good time to tackle those like cleaning the closets, cleaning out our volunteer room. Um, Nancy was another big question mark because she does our um, processing of materials and she can actually, um, she is able to work on her computer without needing to be on Carl. She can still print up her labels. So that was some good news too. Um, so they can link and process the books as normal. So really, I think just the biggest disruption could potentially be the contactless pickup service. But um, I feel like we have a pretty good idea of what to expect and how to troubleshoot it. And we're going to be obviously talking about this a lot in the coming weeks, too. Um, especially Ed and I. Adrian is out of town for um, a few weeks. So it's going to be Ed and I really kind of trying to take care of the um, computer side of things and then just get the access services department situated so they know what's going on. Um, and that's really, that's that's my update on it. <laughs> oh, okay. So a question I would have is, um, is it going to be challenging for department heads, et cetera, to pull the information they need for board reports? Adrian will be gone, so all, you know, all that stuff in consideration of moving our board meeting. By the way, in our bylaws, um, for a regularly scheduled meeting to change the time or the date, it just takes a majority vote of the board. So that's something to keep in mind, but I'd like to know from Emily. So there's the library side of getting ready for that board meeting. The other question would be the city side. It looks like we'll be coming right off of, it's the day after the city commission meeting. And um, so I'm not sure what that, and it's really close to all those changes. It's like the following Monday and Tuesday of the week before when all the servers are up. So in terms of the city's support of our board meetings, that would be a question too. So those are all things I'm gonna float out there. Um, Emily, do you have any? Yeah, you raise a really good point about the stats. Um, so I believe we have to have the board packet posted within 24 hours of the meeting, correct? So that would give us Monday to get the stats together, right? Let me check my dates. What is the day of the week that it's gonna be back up is my you question. You have to have the agenda posted, I believe, 48 hours for a regular board meeting. Okay. Doesn't mean the whole packet has to be, but the yeah. agenda would. So I think that gives us enough time because our meeting is the 25th. Um, so yeah, we should have enough time, I think, to still compile the stats once the server's back up. Um, what about on the city side? I don't know if Carol can even speak to that and anticipate that, but. As far as the packet goes, um, to meet the requirements, what I do a lot of times is I create the notice of the meeting, which is the most critical part with the executive order. And then I just put a, a draft agenda. And then as you know, Emily sends me the exact agenda, then I flush it out and update. So we can do it that way. Um, and I can create that and um, we'll still be able to use the website so I can create that and, and get that ready to post um, and, and get on the front page just like we have that. Um, there's actually, so we're supposed to be offline on the 19th and we already have a guinea pig because the zoning board is going to meet on August 20th. So that's a brave move. Um, so I think certainly um, 
by Tuesday the 25th, I think all the bugs will be out and you should be okay as long as you are comfortable with being able to gather all of your information without network access. Again, we still have web and cloud-based access, so. Okay, thank you, Karen. thank you, Karen. And then in terms of broadcastability, that does not involve our server at all? Well, Richard's moving all of his equipment and yeah, there, there are issues for him, Richard from WROK. Mm -hmm. um, so there are issues for him to get everything, including his computers and everything um, moved over there. Um, we had asked uh, Mr. Gillum for a legal opinion and I can um, ask him again if it's if something were to happen and we could just record meeting, not live stream it and have it available after if that's still considered enough uh, public participation in the meeting because we do have the ability to to have Zoom uh, online without network and Zoom does have the ability to record. It just doesn't have the ability to play live if we don't have a server. So, but I, I really the feel- The has to have access to the meeting while it's happening. I mean, I'm not an attorney. We'll wait for Mr. Gillum, of course, but- Yeah, that's kind of how, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so thank uh, you for the, so WROK yeah, is part of this move too. Uh, everybody's part. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, hey, I think maybe what I might, I might propose a motion right now and we'll see where it goes. Um, I propose uh, a motion that we move our regularly scheduled August 25th board meeting to the following week to September 1st, 2020, same time, 7 p.m. Is there a, there's a second from Melanie. Uh, question. I can tell you the reasons I think I would love a bigger buffer for everybody between all those big changes for server and moving and WOK and the city and the library folks. I would love a bigger buffer just to be sure um, and make sure that we're complying with Open Meetings Act and um, maybe decrease the stress on everybody. It sounds like they've got quite a few meetings they're going to have to try to scramble for on that m Monday the day before. So that's my reasoning. Melanie. Yeah, I totally agree. And I just feel like it sounds like they everyone feels confident they could do it and kudos to them. But I don't think we need them to do it that I think we can give them that extra grace period. So I, I totally agree. Other discussion. My only question would be, are a whole bunch of people going to be on vacation because it's the week Labor Day week and I mean, Labor Day's, you know, six days after that, but some people take off that last week. Right. I'm actually on vacation on the 25th and I was going to be there anyway since it's remote, but it would be more convenient for me on the 1st. It's very likely I too will be on vacation on the 25th and I was going to cross that bridge when I came to it. <laughs> <laughs> but now we've decided to probably go to the UP where internet is not always great. I was trying to be all about that. But. That's how you're trying to get out of a budget meeting, Stacey. We know that was an excuse. Yeah. UP twice in one month. Any other discussion? Okay, uh, we're going to vote on it now and it takes a majority to change the regular schedule, scheduled meeting according to our bylaw. So all in favor of moving our regularly scheduled meeting from August 25th to September 1st at 7 p.m. Say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, let the record reflect that this motion was adopted unanimously. Um, so this now means that we need to update the website to reflect our, um, to change the date from August to September, because we have a list of our, we have a list of our uh, meeting dates there, so that would need to be changed. And then Carol is here to let her know we have a new deadline. She's, it's hot off the presses, Carol, September 1st. Thank you again, Carol, for supporting us in um, getting those meeting notices out and doing all the things you do. You're here. Yes. Okay. Um, hey, Stacey, just really quick. Yes. I just want to thank Emily and Ed and uh, Mike Kirby for the adjustments they made also because we had a discussion about this just yesterday and this level of service has increased exponentially since then. So thank you for working to keep, you know, uh, 
as of yesterday, we didn't have Carl on any computer. So uh, that's been a huge improvement. So thank you, Emily. Yeah, no problem. I mean, as of yesterday, we didn't have any phones either and we were gonna have to close. So you guys saved the day. Good problem solving team. Appreciate it. Okay, um, are there any questions or follow-up uh, folks would like to do with Emily around this whole server outage and all that that means and the plans for continuing service as best as possible for patrons during that week? Okay, discussion item C is revisiting the renovation. I'm gonna hand this over to the facilities committee to sort of lead the sort of thinking about it. So. Mark, would you like to lead the discussion? You're muted. I'm sorry. I'm sure I'll, uh, <clears throat> I can do that. Although both budget and facilities have had discussion about this. So I think Carla ought to have an opportunity to, to uh, talk as well. Okay. So as we indicated, um, we didn't budget for it um, for a number of reasons that we talked about. But we're rethinking that now based on the fact that it looks like the roof is not an imminent issue. Um, as Brandon pointed out in our meeting, um, at least for the coming year, we can count on stable revenue from our property tax levy. <clears throat> and uh, also the building, uh, at least for now, is closed to the public. And so, you know, it'd be an advantageous time for us to have people in working. <clears throat> <clears throat> I'm sorry, excuse me. So we're recommending that we move forward in stages. Um, as Melanie put it in our, our meeting, um, facilities committee meeting, some elements of our plan may no longer be relevant um, due to the COVID world we're living in. And uh, so at the same time, there's some basic things that need to be done that we could move forward with, with having to do with paint, carpeting, flooring, moving of shelving, et cetera. So um, Carla has volunteered to put together a list um, to share with Emily and Brandon, who in turn will share that with uh, library design um, to inquire about the possibility of implementing that. And can we do that in the near future? Um, and so, that's basically where we're at. Um, I think uh, Carla said we're, you know, well, actually, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Carla because Carla has also looked at the figures in terms of what we're talking about in terms of costs and stuff. And so. Um, so we started off just looking at the basement portion um, at our meeting last month here. Um, there was talk about that we might need to move the desk in the basement um, to make it uh, more easily to socially distance and keep the staff safer. So that was why we were starting to look at, okay, well, what could we do? And the basement portion is a lot of moving of furniture and then painting and carpeting. Um, there are a few other changes down there also, but just looking at the basement portion of the project, um, I looked at the, the pricing list that we were given previously, and it was, uh, it looked like it would be just under 200000 to do pretty much all the basement stuff. Um, and then I didn't go through and look at the itemized for upstairs. It, um, as a facilities committee, we talked about, okay, well, you know, what things would it make sense to do? Probably. Um, and it's a lot of the middle of the room stuff The you know, during COVID, we're not really using those, you know, assuming we reopen, we probably wouldn't be using those extra rooms, um, that are, you know, more contained. So it kind of makes sense to do 
the main room where people will be and not those extra rooms where we'll probably have them closed off right now. And there were a lot of questions of, well, what are we doing to the uh, maker space? Are we including it? Aren't we? Are we making bigger changes? Aren't we? Um, there were more questions on those extra rooms, um, but there were, there were fewer things in question in the main space. So um, pr essentially looking at the carpeted area. So not the, the gathering area, which is where the media is currently, um, not looking to do that probably, um, where we were looking to put in the laptop bar. Um, there were, you know, those were significant changes there. Um, but, you know, we were looking to move forward the desk, the, um, is it adult services desk? Is that, that's what it is, right? Yeah. Um, and then add a couple um, rows, a few stacks there, just to fill in that space. Um, and we were looking to change a few of the desk seating things behind that, where instead of four top tables, they would be one top tables that can be separated. Um, so those were things that we were possibly looking to, to include in this, um, because having seats that we can separate would probably be a good thing right now. Um, uh, also, some uh, questions that we put forward towards library design were, um, possibly changing out some of the, the, we were looking to get some new seating in the basement, some couch type things, and possibly making changes to the plan that would make it easily to, more easy, easy to socially distance families. Um, but it would be a very similar plan, just with tweaks that would make it more appropriate for the current world that we're living in. Um, so the budget committee, discussed if they if we felt comfortable moving forward with this phase plan and we said yes um a two hundred thousand to three hundred and fifty thousand dollar plan we felt very comfortable that we have the money to do those things Th these are not like controversial like flashy things that w these are things that will make the library more usable and they're things that we need like we need to deal with carpet and paint and um, it's shuffling furniture to make it more usable. So um, we felt like we could back that up when we would make an argument, you know, present it to city commission that we wanted to do this project. And so we felt very comfortable with that. And we also felt comfortable telling library design that we want to continue um, looking at phase two. Um, we quite possibly will feel comfortable to do phase two quickly. Um, so we wanna keep working forward on that. Um, we Budget committee felt comfortable with our financial situation that we can definitely move forward. Thank you, Mark and Carla. What kind of questions or comments, Erin? Just going off something that Mark had said, when I read about uh, this idea, I was really excited, but I am concerned I would hate to close down the library right after we reopen as a frequent uh, visitor of the library. That would just be so disappointing. So it, it's really hard. Do we start it now and hope we can finish some of these things, get them knocked off, and off our list before we reopen? Or is it something that can be done um, during closed, biz closed hours? I would just hate to, for us to reopen and then close the library for renovations. Um, I think the hope is that um, we those times will overlap, so we might be able to use our closed time to get it done. That would be awesome. Yeah. Um, I mean, it all depends on um, library design and what their schedules look like. And I mean, we don't know how long we're closed, um, but yeah. Thank you. And don't forget that the next phase also is the grab and go with very limited amount of time inside the library and limited areas open. So, you know, if if we are in the next phase for some reason, we can also work around that, I think. Also, the, um, 
you know, this is really the bulk of the footprint of the library for this stuff. Um, and the other, the phase two of the project is in these side rooms. It will be a lot easier to complete those parts of the project while the library is still up and running. Catherine. I was just going to say, if we can swing it financially, I mean, odds are in Brandon adding about the next phase that we're going to be closed. So if we have to limit the amount of time for the public to be in there, let's do it when we're already limiting it and get it done. Melanie, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I just want to say that, um, at least in the facilities committee, we were kind of discounting the teen room, but um, Emily did say that she expected that when we are back open that we are going to get a lot of teen business again. Um, so I just wanted to throw out there the thought about that area as well. Um, that was a pretty big piece of our of the renovation and I had been thinking it wouldn't serve us during COVID times but Emily thinks it might and if so is that something we should be considering as part of this too. Aaron. I think a lot will de depend on if the schools are open. If the schools aren't available for teenagers, but we are, we could see a lot, a lot more visitors coming in. Of course, we don't know what our limit will be. If we'll have, I saw a number of 80 patrons at a time. So hard. There's so many unknowns. Emily. Yeah, I just um, seconding that really you know at first I was like well well if the schools are closed and we won't have the teens but actually I think we'd have more teens because a lot of the teens we get are teens who are waiting out between school and their parents picking them up so and that's a separate discussion but I think we could have teens and possibly sitting there all day so um, I think there's no way around it we will be getting teens in the library once we're reopened. Not that that's a bad thing. I just mean, <laughs> are you going to have all the extra rooms open for people? I mean, I, right now there's no door on the team room, right? So you wouldn't really be keeping them out. But um, the extra rooms that are smaller that have doors on them, I would imagine that you might have them closed. They're all closed yeah. per the policy. Yeah. Uh, I'll throw in there too with the teens. Um, while I agree with Melanie that we should do the team room now. Um, because that I do think it would be popular. Um, it would take a change of policy for the teens to be in there any longer than any, any other patron because grab and go ROPL is time limited. Um, everyone has, you know, about an hour in the library because we're, we're still trying to keep people in and out and in and out. We don't, we're not here to loiter at the time. Um, as much as we all miss being inside the building, you know, it, we're trying to keep people moving. Uh, Melanie and then Aaron. Yeah, that's true, but this renovation isn't just for the next phase or the next month. It's for it's for forever, and I mean, I don't know how long each of these COVID phases will last, but it sounds more and more like the um, at least having some carefulness about it is going to last a really long time. So, right. I mean, even if it's not grab-and-go applicable, I think it still could be long-term applicable. I agree with Melanie completely. Erin? I was just wondering, Emily, have you talked to the other libraries that have reopened? I know that Birmingham's library recently reopened. Are they getting a large number of patrons inside the building? They are, yes. Yeah. Um, they're in the middle of a renovation, too. So uh -huh. it's kind of a, an interesting situation. Are people bringing in their kids? Are teenagers coming in? Um, you know, I haven't asked about that specifically, but um, they're right now, they're in their limited capacity, so I assume not. Um, I think how, how libraries are handling it is you can't bar people from bringing kids. Um, you can't, you have to remain neutral in your policy. So like we couldn't say like, you know, we're setting this side at this time aside for senior citizens. And I know some libraries are talking about like banning children. You can't do any of that. What you can do is encourage that um, I, I would say like we use language like we encourage one person at a time, you know, and if possible to please avoid bringing families in, but no, we can turn them away. Um, so I think that that's kind of the situation at Baldwin because they're on the limited uh, time and capacity is they probably don't get a lot of children and their children's room is actually under renovation right now. So I think that would especially deter people from showing up. Uh, you know, there's just one thing I wanted to add too is with the teen room, the changes, the plan changes are conducive to social distancing. So that might work in favor of um, 
making that decision. I mean, if you think about it, the problem with the team right now is they're on top of each other, they're crammed in there, and this would create more space and more computers for them to sit at. Erin. Um, I know this is a discussion to be had at a later date, but we will have to think about if the schools are closed. I feel like we really, um, one of our, one of my main things that I'm proud about for the library is how we serve the kids who, whose parents aren't home yet. And so I really do want to spend time discussing how we can help those kids that have all day waiting on their parents to, to get off work. And, you know, I hope that we don't have to limit them to one hour, but it is a discussion we'll have to have. Um, in terms of tonight, this is a discussion item, but something I'm wondering about is we don't have to have every detail sorted out, but what it feels like in terms of the consensus on the board right now from what I'm hearing in discussion is that we would like to move to a phased plan. And, um, I'm wondering if we need to get the ball rolling for a budget amendment that needs to go before the city commission because we did not budget for this project. So we'd have to move money from um, our um, fund balance into the line for, mm, help me Carla, it's a- uh, Capital outlay. Capital outlay, yep. It wasn't gonna come to me, thanks Brandon. Um, so if we did do that, um, because then it has to go before the city commission. We'd have to get on their agenda. It sounds like it's better to get on the August 10th agenda than on the August 24th agenda. I'm <laughs> um, wondering if we should get that ball rolling um, and then we can work out the details um, later in terms of which things when and facilities could look at that and make a proposal to the board. Um, Mark, you're on mute though, Mark. Um, that, that sort of feels backwards to me. I, I, I think we need to sit down with LDA and hammer out a proposal and find out what their timelines are. Um, because I, I don't envision, I mean, we'd like to see this begin before the end of the year, right? But, uh, whether or not they're in a position to do that, I mean, we don't know. I mean, there's a lot of unknowns here. To, um, and, and just based on this discussion, um, we may want to go further in terms of our renovations than what um, was initially proposed tonight. Um, we're talking about the, the teen area now and stuff. I just, I think that uh, once we have some more information and have a pretty firm sort of round figure uh, about what it's been solved, that would be the time to go to the city commission for a budget amendment. Thanks, Mark. That's a good way to think about it. Brandon. Um, I'll, I'll add to that too, that this is going out to bid. So really what we need to do is figure out what we want to do, have it bid, have the bid come back, and then we would fund the bid. So we, right. uh, there's a lot of steps. I mean, I, I, I move the money today. I'd move all of it, fund balance into this because I, I really, been itching for this, but um, I, I I agree with Mark. We have a lot of steps that, but yeah, sure we could, but we might have to make another amendment in the future. So why we could do all at once? Good point, guys. I was trying to not have us have more roadblocks, but I think you're probably right. Um, other discussion. Okay, so my question is, is the facility, now that the board, we've got like a sense from the board, like, yes, is the facilities committee planning to meet again and pull together some proposals to get this ball rolling or how, how should we proceed? Carla. Um, I, so currently Brandon is um, contacting Kyle. So uh, when we get a little bit more info from Kyle, then I assume that the facilities committee will meet again. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping that um, by the next meeting, we'll have something concrete to bring to our next meeting. And it's not, we have an extra week too, right? About so. another week. Mark. I, I think the way we left it is that Emily and Brandon would be in contact. 
contact with library design. I think the, the library director ought to be the point person. Not that Brandon shouldn't be involved, but um, you know, if you think about it, um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, board sets policy, makes decisions about what's going to be done, staff carries it out. That's true of the city commission. It's true with the school board. It ought to be true with, with, our, with this body as well, I think. Um, so I just want to make sure that Emily is the, is the person that it goes to. Thanks, Mark. So Brandon and Emily will work together to sort out the concrete actions that have to happen and so we're not putting the cart before the horse. Okay, anything else on um, revisiting the renovation? Okay, well, then we are at adjournment time if someone would like to make a motion. So moved. Catherine. Catherine. <laughs> Is there a second? Roxanne seconds. Thanks, Roxanne. Any discussion about adjourning? <laughs> All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. Okay, let the record reflect that this motion was adopted unanimously. Uh, thanks for um, taking notes, Brandon. Thanks to all the board members that have served tirelessly on these committees. Thank you to staff and to our director for all the problem solving you've been doing just pretty much nonstop every day. We really appreciate you and I'm really proud of our library in um, what you've been able to do during this crazy time. So thank you. And we'll see you guys on September 1st. Change it in your calendars. Don't forget. Thank you to the board too for always being supportive and for getting so much done. <laughs> thank you. All right. Good night, guys. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.